If there is not a desire in you, there is not a passion in you, there is not a craving in you, if there is not a longing in you to be closer to Jesus today than you were yesterday, you will not be. If the weeds of this world and the toils and the cares of life have choked out the Word of God in you, and you are just going on coast. Beware that you're not choked to death. Beware that the life of God is not strangled out of you by the things of this world, by the deceitfulness of riches, by the lust of the eye, and the lust of the flesh. Those things come to choke the Word out of us and to choke the life of God out of us. And if we let it, if we let it, we will lose revival. We will lose a personal revival and we'll lose a corporate revival. And what started as a mighty flame of fire in Father's Arms Fellowship what started as a mighty flame of fire in your heart the day that you were saved and maybe the day you were baptized in the Holy Ghost. What started as a mighty fire, the fire of Pentecost. The enemy can throw such water on that flame and can get us so distracted that that flame goes and begins to wane and the ember begins to go out and it become, begins to come, become cold. And we're talking about revival. We want to have a revival. Now, we can't have a revival just because we put it out here on this sign. We can't have a revival just because we get together and sing songs and someone preaches no matter how hard and hot and heavy they preach. We can't have a revival just because we do all the right things. We can only have a revival if we're hungry for more of Jesus. I saw in the Baptist church yesterday, I, was, I did a wedding at First Baptist Church, and I saw in the Sunday school room, how do you know if you're a Christian? And the answer underneath I liked, it was in the Sunday school room, it says, if you love Jesus with all your heart. That's a little too simple, we think, don't we? But it's not too simple at all. That's what revival is. Revival is that we love Jesus with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. Re revival is we love Jesus more than anything else. If we had to give up our houses and our lands and our cars and our spouses or our girlfriends, or our boyfriends, or whatever was in our life, no matter what come between us and God, revival is, that's not important. I'll give it up in a minute. That's revival. Revival is commitment. Revival is repenting. I guess you saw it on the sign. I put This just came up out of my spirit. So I said, put this on the sign. It came up out of my spirit. Revival is repenting, restoring, and refreshing. Mm -hmm. That's what revival is. And the first thing that revival is, is repenting. The first thing revival is, is repenting. Let me tell you what repenting is not. Repenting is not coming to an altar and crying. That's not repenting. Now, would be fine if you did. I'd love to see some people, including myself, weeping. Amen? Because of the conviction of our souls. Because we're passionate about something. 
Every, every person in this room is passionate about something. You might be passionate about making money. You might be passionate about going to see Star Wars. Maybe you got in line real early Thursday night. You might be passionate about a lot of things. But are you just as passionate, and I shouldn't say just as, are you more passionate about your love for the Lord? Are you? Is there things in your life before Him? What if God told you to give up a person you were dating because they weren't good for you? Or you were unequally yoked, they were going one direction, you're going another. What if God told you to quit your job and do something different for Him? What if He told you to move into a smaller house what if He told you to move into a smaller house with a smaller yard so you could give more time to working for Him? What if He said, you don't need to keep up with the Joneses. You don't have to have a brand new car. I want you to give that money to missions. Or I want you to put that money into the youth center. Or I want you to put that money somewhere else. What if God told you to do that? What if He put that on your heart? Remember the rich young man that came to Jesus and said, Lord, what must I do to be saved, uh, to uh, inherit eternal life? And he said, uh, he said, you know, obey the commandments. And he said, oh, I've obeyed the commandments since my youth. He said, well, then just take everything you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me. Lord, I can't do that. And he went away sorrowful because he couldn't turn loose of what he had. What he had had him. What he had had him. Does what you have have you? Is there a person in your life that has you? Is there a relationship in your life that has you? Is there anything in your life that's before the Lord? Let me tell you how I can tell, tell what's the priority of your life. What do you think about the most? What do you spend the most time doing? What do you spend the most time talking about? What do you spend your money on? That's a test of where our hearts are. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Where our thoughts are, that's where our heart is. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. is what you're talking about. That's what's in your heart. That's what's filled your heart. I guess you can tell this morning the Holy Ghost has been dealing with me about repentance this week. Early, early this week, He spoke to me about repentance. Yesterday, Nancy and I were driving down the road. And I... <laughs> oh, see, I need... I, so I started speaking in tongues in the car. And I said, quick, get your ink pen. Start writing this down. And I'd talk in tongues and I'd interpret and she'd write it down. And I'd speak in tongues and interpret and she'd write it down. And I'd speak in tongues and she'd in interpret and she'd write it down. And that's my message this morning. It's my in the interpretation. It's right here. And it's about repenting. And in that tongues and interpretation, the Lord gave me 14 things we need to repent of as a church and as a people. I'm sure there's more. But that's what the Holy Ghost gave me for now. If you'll look in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Rosite baranda bashatahasi. Bless the Lord. Debbie, stand up. I have a word for you from the Lord. Astondi kiaramaro hosata mandile hosata. 
the seeds that you have planted, some have seemingly gone into even a remission. And you have seen that which had sprouted, and you have seen that which looked as it were blooming and going to bring forth much fruit go into a time of seemingly remission. But the Spirit of the Lord is saying, do not be discouraged. God is not mocked. That which you have sown, you will reap, saith the Spirit of the living God. It shall surely come forth. What has happened, and I saw in the Spirit a cold snow of winter over the fruit that had grown. The seed has not stopped growing, but what has happened in the lives of those is that they're in a winter season. And the Spirit said to me yesterday, that spring is almost here. And it'll bloom again, and this year it will bring forth the fruit that had not brought forth before. Hallelujah. Woo, Rasanda Mahatai. Bless the Lord. Acts 3.19 says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. What are we wanting in these revival meetings? Refreshing. Times of refreshing from the Lord. Times of refreshing from God. We want to be restored and rekindled on fire for God with all of our hearts, with passion and hunger and desire. Oh, I want that passion to be in me. And that zeal of God that consumed Jeremiah. The zeal of God is consuming. It burns in my soul, the Word says. Well, for us to have that refreshing, he said, repent. 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 And be converted that times of refreshing may come. Do you know what hinders us from having the flow of the Holy Ghost 24-7? Sin. We don't repent quick enough. We leave things on the account. Do you know how fast God forgives us according to 1 John 1-9? If we're faithful and... If we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he said, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from how much unrighteousness? All. How much? All. Let me say something to you today. If you've confessed sin to God through the blood of Christ, and He has not forgiven you, then He is an unfaithful God and an unjust God. Open your Bible. Look at 1 John 1, 9 if you don't believe me. It says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us. Some of you are walking around with thinking you've got all this sin on you and all this condemnation. Diane said we're not under condemnation. Uh, Romans 8, 1. And we're not. If you've confessed your sin, some of you have a wrong idea about sin. If you have confessed your sin to God, then He's faithful and just to forgive you. And right on the reverse of that, if He didn't forgive you, He wouldn't be faithful and just. He wouldn't be faithful to the blood of His Son. Do you think for a minute the God of the universe that gave up His own Son's life would hold your sin against you that you put under that blood? I'm thinking of the love I have for my Son, which is nothing compared to the love that God has for His Son. The Bible says in Romans 8, Who is it that condemneth? Who 
is it that condemneth? It's God that justifies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Nothing can. One of the things we need to repent of today is not on my list, but it's coming out of my spirit right now. Is, and this came, this came up to my mind yesterday when I was praying too, but I didn't write it down. A disreverence to the blood. A disreverence to the blood. We bring a disreverence to the blood when we walk around with condemnation of sin. Talk about trampling underfoot the blood of the covenant. <coughs> when we say my sin is greater than the blood, it's blasphemy. He's faithful and just to forgive us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah! Respect the blood, people. Respect the blood. But be quick repenters. Because if we don't confess our sins, God doesn't have anything to work with. We've got to be quick confessors. I'm telling you, it's not two or three minutes after I sin. Sometimes not even that long. That I don't let that just stay on me. I don't let it stay on me. I couldn't go to sleep Friday night. <laughs> Debbie knows. I couldn't go to sleep Friday night until I worked through some things. I was hurt with the amount of people that showed up for our work night. I almost cried. I was so mad and hurt. And then the Lord began to deal with me when I went home that my expectations were too high on people. I wasn't thinking of their two-hour drive from Cape to get home. I wasn't thinking of their five children that they had to watch. I wasn't thinking of some of the other things that they had to, had to do in their life. And I, I couldn't go to sleep. I told Deb, I said, I'm not going to be able to go to sleep till I forgive them, till I work through this. But it hurt me that out of 100 notices that I sent out this week, eight people showed up to work. It, it just hurt me. I was hurt. But you know, that's not about you. That's about me. When you're hurt with someone, it's not about them, it's about you. You can only hurt someone if they give you permission. And if their expectations are too high or wrong. Come on. So pastor had to get his act together Friday night. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The word repent here in every place that I looked in the Greek this week, the word repent does not mean what we think it means. The word repent means a change of mind. To turn in thinking is what it means in the Greek literally. To turn in thinking. We are a people who thinks wrong. And anyone who thinks wrong will act wrong. If you think wrong, you'll act wrong. Is it alright for me to say this in this crowd? I think it is. Our, 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 well, you know I'm going to say whatever I want to anyway. <laughs> Oprah Winfrey had a show last week and there were teenagers by the multitudes having oral sex. Stating that this isn't sex. 13, 12, 13, 14 year old children. Wrong thinking. Wrong thinking. Compromising. Lying to themselves. This isn't sex. It's just like giving somebody a good night kiss. That's what one girl said. People, this is this is what's going on in our society. And if you if you and whoever listens to this tape that I'm going to send out, if you don't get your kids in church and teach them the word of God. The people out at the school and the psychologists and the, and the sin system of our world will just tell your kids it's alright to do that. And one of them may end up with AIDS. 
And besides ending up with AIDS, they're ending up with a hard heart, a broken heart. I'm telling you, sin is sin. Darkness is darkness. The Bible says, Woe to him that calleth good evil and good and evil good. You know what would be better for you than to deceive yourself into thinking something's all right? Just to admit to God, I'm wrong and I choose to be in rebellion about it. If you'll admit that, God will work you over good and He'll get you out of it. But if you lie to yourself, you're going to move into a spirit of deception and you could lose everything that you have spiritually and move backwards in your relationship with God because of lying to yourself. First John, in that same chapter of 1, it says, If we say we have no sin, I believe it's verse 7. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We need to start calling a spade a spade. Don't call it a heart. It isn't. Amen. Call it what it is. Call it what it is. Sin is sin. Drugs in our society, including the misuse of prescription drugs, is rampant. And it's sorcery. Look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. It says, The fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the whoremonger, the sorcerer, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Sorcery, from the Greek word pharmakia, that's where we get our word pharmacy, is the abuse of drugs. We have a culture that abuses drugs and thinks it's okay. Let me say something about alcohol. Alcohol is a drug. It's not good, people, for Christians to involve themselves in drinking. Look at Proverbs. I think it's 16.1, I think it is. It says, don't look at the wine when it's red in the cup. It says, wine is a deceiver. And Strong drink is a viper and it talks about the sting that it can give you. How many people thought they could drink casual, social, and got addicted and out of control with their, their alcohol? I see some hands waving around in this place. I'm telling you, the only reason I haven't uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I wanted to drink a glass of wine so bad with dinner. I thought, there's nothing wrong with it. The Bible says, be not drunk with wine where it's in excess. I'm not going to be in excess. I'm just going to drink a little wine. And then I remembered my ordination. And I remember telling Brother Hagen I'd never drink any wine. And I said, or any alcohol. So I didn't do it. And another thing I remember Brother Hagen telling us, he told us a story of a minister. And is it a sin? Is it a sin to drink a glass of wine? Not personally, maybe. Maybe not personally. But you read over there in Galatians. And Paul said, don't do anything where you might cause your brother to stumble. And I remember Brother Hagin telling a story how a minister went out and had a glass of uh, wine with his meal, very innocently. A member of his church was there at the restaurant saw him the man had been an alcoholic but had been delivered from alcohol and drinking all together for years saw him and thought well if it's okay for the pastor to just to have one drink I can just have one drink and isn't that r rational thinking sure that's good rational thinking it's just that he was an alcoholic and what the pastor did was he caused this little one to stumble. And the man went back into alcohol and died an alcoholic. I don't want that on my shoulder. Now, I don't want to put that on you. 
But if the Holy Ghost puts it on you, wear it. What was it? Proverbs 21, verse 1, not 16. Sorry about that. There's a lot of things we need to judge ourselves about as Christians that we do or don't do. In relating to the Holy Ghost, relating to the... I, it may take me three weeks to preach this, or three... I might have to preach some more of this tonight. I don't know. I'm not going to be able to give any of this due time because I haven't even got into my notes. Things to repent of. Number one, grieving the Spirit of God. Ephesians 4 says, Grieve not the Spirit of God. Then he tells us how the Spirit of God is grieved. Is grieved by bitterness. Verse 31. And wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking and malice. He says, Put all that away. And then verse 32, and he says, This is how you get the Holy Ghost movement again. From grieving Him to yielding to Him, you yield to Him, you're kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Tender-hearted. Say tender-hearted. Tender-hearted. It's not easy to be tender-hearted in our society, is it, people? Our society, there's a lot of wounds that we get in our society, uh, you know, and the hurts that we receive. And the hurts that some of you are still carrying around from your childhood. You still have not worked through. Still have not worked through the abuse of the way your daddy talked to you. How he put you down. Men and women alike. Some of you have not gotten through the sexual abuse that you had. Men and women alike in this room. And the percentage is great. We've got to get to the place where we forgive those things and move on in our life. How, whatever it takes to, to move on from that. If it takes getting, going to the elders and the pastors or whoever for counseling and prayer, you do it. Get that out of your life. Get it out. Get it out. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Is God in Christ's sake has forgiven you. Forgiveness. The, the second thing that we want to repent of is defiling the temple. This is how it came out in tongues yesterday, so I'm going to give it to you the way it came out. 1 Corinthians 3.17 says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy which ye are. Why are so many people getting cancer? Why are so many people being attacked with physical ailments? Because we're defiling the temple. We're defiling the temple with things that we eat, the lack of sleep that we get, smoking cigarettes. Overuse of medications will destroy your liver. Destroy your liver. Alcohol destroy your liver and your brain cells. I'm telling you, some of you in this room that are drinking alcohol, listen to me. You need every brain cell you have. I know you, and you need them. <laughs> Amen. Every time you take a drink of alcohol, it kills brain cells. Can you believe that? You'd think, how much have you had, Pastor? <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't had none. <laughs> Just think of what kind of shape I'd be in if I did. <laughs> Defiling the temple. Why did God give... I've heard people say, why did, God give, why did God give that to my mother? Listen, I've had three family members die from smoking cigarettes. My best friend in the entire world my grandmother. I'm glad my mother's not here this morning. My best friend in the whole world who loved Jesus, and I know she's in heaven, but the temple got destroyed. The temple got destroyed. You know, the Bible says, talks about turning, 
such a one over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh, that their soul might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. We're not talking about your, your soul being lost. I'm talking about your body being lost. I'm talking about you dying 10, 15, 20 years before you need to. Diane just lost Mike. And if it was Diane preaching right now, she'd be, she'd be screaming a lot louder than me about this subject. But I'm hurt about it, and I'm going to talk to you straight. Please, please pray about repenting over this. Please repent. I don't want to do your funeral. You don't, you don't realize how bad I do not want to do another funeral of somebody who sucked on those cancer sticks for 20 or 30 years. My grandmother, my best friend, up till the day she died, up till the day she died of emphysema brought on by the cigarettes. You, I'm not bashing you. I'm not telling you you're going to hell. Can you go to heaven and smoke? Yes. Smell like hell when you get yeah, that's right. You smell like hell when you get... Can you go to heaven and chew? Yes, but you have to go to hell to spit. <laughs> I'm trying to lighten it up just a little because, but I do want you to take it serious. I, I, have, I have my other grandfather on my dad's side died of emphysema from smoking all his life. Her mother died of emphysema from smoking till her last breath. I'm fat. I need to get the weight off. My dad had a heart attack when he was 50. I am praying to God during the next two weeks. I'm going to be doing some fasting that I can get control of this. I don't want to have a heart attack when I'm 50. Mm -hmm. That gives me six more years to or eight more years to preach. If I were to drop dead at the age my dad had a heart attack, I've got eight more years to preach. And then, wasn't he a good pastor? Mm -hmm. Wasn't he a good pastor? Everybody loved him. He was full of love, wasn't he? Yeah, but he was stupid. Because he didn't deal with his diet. I, I don't mean to be hard. I'm just saying, could we get serious for a little while? Yeah, we want to jump and shout, and I want you to. I want you to have a good time and rejoice in God. And know there's no condemnation. But there is judgment on the flesh. It says, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Does God directly destroy you? No. But He turns you over to Satan who destroys the flesh. You've really done it to yourself. You really don't need God or Satan. We're just killing ourselves. You know? And that turning over to Satan for the destruction of your flesh passage is 1 Corinthians 5, 3 and 5. I don't mean to make this heavy today. I don't want you all to be mad at me, but I do want you to repent. Really, I don't care if you're mad at me, tell you the truth. Don't care a bit. Just get mad if you want. Just stomp around and say about how bad I am if you want to. If you'd listen to me, I might save your life. Get on a mega vitamins, flush that crap out of your body from the pit of hell. Hallelujah. I might be prophesying here this morning and save your life. Yeah. Hallelujah. You know, if you love somebody, you tell them the truth. If they're in a burning building, you say, oh, I don't want to hurt their feelings. They don't want to come out. <laughs> Knock them in the head and drag them out of there. No matter if they want to come out of there. I am praying that all of us get this into the us. I'm praying all of us get this into us. And use whatever means it takes. That's true. However you have to quit. However you have to quit. If you don't have the willpower, get some help. If you need help, get it. If it'll save your life, get it. You ever see anybody shrivel up and die from cancer? I'm staying on this. I'm sorry, Lord, help me, Jesus. I don't know. How many have you seen shrivel up and die from cancer? Hundreds. 
No, not a good way. Good way to die is just in your rocking chair when you're 95 years old. You've done everything God told you to do, and you just kick off and just take up out of, the, out of here. Hallelujah. It deprives your body of oxygen. It deprives your body of nutrients. Has 4,000 chemicals in one cigarette. People, 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 people. I'm moving to the next point. Hallelujah. And all God's people said. Amen. Move on, brother. Number three. The works of the flesh. This is what we need to repent of. And Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery. Now Jesus said when you look at a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. So you don't have to go out and be sleeping with somebody to commit adultery. You can just do it in your mind. And if you think it's only men doing it, I tell you what, wake up and smell the roses. I have never seen the amount of lascivious women in my entire life. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. It, did. it used to be all the men. It used to be all men. Well, maybe it never did used to be, but it used to be a higher percentage of men. We just thought it was. But there is a Jezebel spirit loosed upon this earth in the last days before the Lord comes, and the women are taking over the roles of men and moving in and out of, uh, out of the position that God had them ever to be in and moving into a uh, a perversion of what God wanted them to do. And so you see lust, just adultery. Fornication. The Greek word fornication here it, it includes all sexual immorality. And it's the Greek word porneo. Does that sound like anything? Porno. Pornography. How much pornography is in the church? Well, let me tell, me how, let me tell you how much is in the ministry. 40% of Assembly of God ministers surveyed said they had been at one time or another or are addicted to internet pornography. And they're not worse than everybody else. You know that. Let me tell you people, you young people over here, you young boys and young girls, I used to think only... only uh, Boys struggle with pornography. I used to think that. I found out in the last few years there's a lot of women struggling with that. I couldn't believe it. Could not believe it. Because you know men are more visual. Y'all stay away from that stuff. Because it's addictive. All sin is addictive. And it takes you to the... You want worse and worse. And, and I know from personal experience and you know I know from personal experience that it's a trap from the pit of hell. It's just as hard to come off the cigarettes because it's a mental thing. And I had to fight it a long time. I had to fight it a long time. I still can't get near it. I can't get near it. And you can't either. Men in this room, repent. If you need counseling or help, go get it. I had a man in my office a year ago come in and said, he doesn't come to this church, goes to, goes to another church, some other city. He said, I need you to pray for me for, uh, against the spirit of lust. I said, I started praying over him, and a demon started talking out of me. Him, not me. No. <laughs> demon started talking out of him and said, you can't have him. I said, well, I, in Jesus' name, you can't have him. Come out of there, in Jesus' name. That spirit of lust come out of him, and he was free. And he told me a year later, he, it's not too long ago, he said, I'm still free. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen. You, think that, you think there ain't demons involved in this? There is. Oh, yes. You bet there is. And there's demons involved sometimes in the, in the cigarette smoking. Oh, Spirit of rebellion. Oh. So other spirits that are involved. Sometimes we need to take, take authority over the devil, people. If you give the devil an inch, he'll take a mile. It's the truth. Fornication is pornography and it includes all other stuff. Uncleanness. 
And that moves over into the area of uh, even homosexuality, the uncleanness does. Lasciviousness. That's dressing slutty. You girls in this, you young girls in this church, listen to me. Don't dress slutty. Don't wear shorts up to your butt. Come on. You're going to cause lust in some some little little boy. And you, and you guys, the way some of, I'm telling you, oh, help me, Jesus. Me and Jerry was at, we took the whole youth group to, to St. Louis. And there was a guy in a swimming suit, I swear to you. <laughs> GQ guy. Mesh. You saw the whole thing in the back. In the back. You saw the whole thing in the back. Now, I'm sorry, but that is sin. Sin. S-I-N. Pitiful. If I looked that good, I might be tempted to dress that way. I, sometimes I think, God just said, no. In Jesus' name, I thank you I'm delivered, Lord. Idolatry. Witchcraft. <coughs> hatred. You think you can hate somebody and go to heaven? You can't. Variance. Emulations. Wrath. Seditions, heresies, envyings. You know, envy is a work of the flesh. Wanting something somebody else has. Wishing you looks like somebody. It is terrible. I've I've looked at well, I wish I looked that good. Covetousness. Murders, it says. You murder somebody with your words. You know slander is murder, murder in, the, in the Greek? If you slander another person, that's a form of murder. Drunkenness. Drunkenness. God's people are not be getting drunk. Why are we getting drunk on the Holy Ghost? You don't even need to be getting close to being drunk. You don't even need to be getting tipsy unless it's on the Holy Ghost. Revelings. That means just wild parties. That's what it means in the, in the Greek. And such like of the which I tell you before as I told you in time past that they which do things, such things, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. How many of you want to inherit the kingdom of God? Well, I want to inherit the kingdom of God. And I'm going to stay away from that junk. I'm going to keep it out of my life. Amen? Amen. We got it. We, does that mean if you ever did one of those that you can't go to heaven? No. That means if you're walking in that. If you're living a life of practicing these things. You're not going to walk in the kingdom of God. In the area of debt, at times, what we have done, and before I get into the scripture, oh, misuse of finance, number seven. Yeah, that's another one, too. It's called usury in the Old Testament, U S U R Y. When you look it up in the Old Testament, you'll see usury. Don't, don't get in debt with, with interest, high interest. What we have done as a culture and what we are teaching our children to do, we've got to, we've got to reverse this, people. You, got, you, are going to, you and your children are going to pay the debt of this if we don't reverse this. Don't teach your children, well, honey, get it now and you can pay it off. Teach them, you don't need it until you save up enough to pay cash for it. We are a culture of people that wants it now, wants it now, wants it now, wants it now, and pay it off later. What did our parents do? What did my grandparents do? They paid their house off 
And everything that they bought in that house, they saved for it, and then they bought it one thing at a time. And when they died, they had hundreds of thousands of dollars in the, in the, so that they'd saved. No, you're n none of us are raised that way. I wasn't raised that way. And you know, it's going to be hard to get out of where we're at. But now's the time to start saying, if I don't have the money, I'm going to save up for it. I'm not going to take my tithe money and go get something that I don't really need and put myself under a curse and so I'll have even less just because I, I want something frivolous. Because I've got to have a, a new this and a new that and a fancier this and a fancier that. Jesus said, Matthew 6, 25 to 33, So my counsel is don't worry about things. Say things. Food, drink, clothes, for you already have life and a body, and they are far more important than what we eat and wear. Look at the birds. They don't worry about what to eat. They don't need to sow or reap or store up food, for your heavenly Father feeds them, and you are far more valuable to Him than they are. Will all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothes? Look at the uh, field lilies. They don't worry about theirs. Yet King Solomon in all his glory was not clothed as beautifully as they. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are already here today and gone tomorrow, don't, won't he more surely care for you, O oh men of little faith? So don't worry at all about having enough food and clothing. Why be like the heathen? For they take pride in all these things and are deeply concerned about them. But your heavenly Father already knows perfectly well what you need, and He will give them to you if you give Him first place. Say first place. First place in your life and live as He wants you to do. And the King James Version said on that same verse, it says, but seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. And all these other things will be added unto you. Amen? We put God first. We put His way first. We put His way first in our finances. We put His way first in everything that we do. And eventually, if we do, if you're in trouble right now, start working the biblical principles of finances. I have a tape series back here on biblical principles of prosperity it's probably one of the best ones out. It's probably better than Copeland's and Hagen's. Because I tell you some stuff in there that they don't tell you. I tell you uh, about the in, in interest. And I tell you about some other things. I go through every scripture on and every, everything that I can find in the entire scripture about finances. And if we do our finances God's way, we'll stay out of trouble. It's not just tithing. If you think you can go and buy everything on credit that you want and pay your tithes. And that will just magically get you out of that. You can't disobey all the rest of the scripture about money. And then expect God to come rescue you because you're tithed. Right. Now he might in his mercy do that. But you've broken a lot of scriptural principles. It goes back to another one word. Anybody know what it is? It starts with an R. Mm -hmm. Repent. Need to repent in our finances. We need to repent in our sexuality. We need to repent in our relationships. We need to repent in our jobs. We've got a lot of repenting we need to do. Seeking things is one of them. We'll stop now. Hallelujah! You know, in the Old Testament, the Word of God says, He says, I want you... He said, I set before you a blessing and curse. I set before you a blessing and a curse. He said, choose blessing. The choice is ours. We can repent and receive times of refreshing. Ooh, I want that refreshing. Get me Holy Ghost. I want to get Holy Ghost drunk. I hope I get so sloppy drunk in these meetings that they have to drag me home. And Greg, uh, they had to, it, when I went down to Brother Hagin's meeting, they had to carry me to the car. They had to carry me to the, uh, had to carry me to the uh, hotel room. 
I was sloppy drunk, I tell you. I want to get sloppy drunk in the Holy Ghost in these meetings to where I don't even know who I am and where I am. And if you all want to get refreshed, this is how we get refreshed. We start. See, we got two weeks of these meetings. You think, man, is all this meeting going to be repentant? It probably might. But by the time we get done repenting, we'll be so refreshed and so free. How, how do you feel if you... we got some sandbags out here. How would you feel if you took one of those 80-pound sandbags, put it around your neck and walked around all day with it? Because they're kind of they're long, you know, and they're, they're, they're a tube sandbag. And you could kind of put it around your neck. How do you think you'd feel? Well, that's what sin is. It weighs you down. Some of us have got weights on us. We're going to get rid of them. And then times of refreshing are coming. The winds of the Spirit are fixing to blow through this place. And anybody who wants revival can have revival. Yeah. Glory. Hallelujah. We can have that joy unspeakable and full of glory. Yeah. And all we got to do is repent. And the Holy Ghost will come. And we can receive that gift of the Holy Ghost. And Peter said to them, Repent, let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is fixing to pour out Himself and His gifts in us as we do the repenting we need to do. How many people are willing to give up some stuff in your life? So, how many of you are willing to trade some stuff? That's, how many of you are willing to trade some of these heavy weights for some joy? For some peace. Yes. 